So good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, on this beautiful weekend. I think it's sunny for most of us. Uh, it's for us quite rare here in the north. <laughs> but we have sunshine and uh, yeah, we're very, very happy to that all of you have the time and that you can join. And we are very, very thankful that Ben Mary is uh, also joining us with Zoom and uh, she when we or when yeah when we started to talk that we have to find an alternative and we cannot have the uh, retreats on site at land of joy when mary said of course we do it via zoom so uh, now she's an expert <laughs> zooming in liverpool and uh, in denmark so it's very great i just want to let you know that uh, she had some difficulties with her computer so she's on her ipad and also please um, be patient with us because we can't really do anything if the connection stops for a few seconds. Just have the patience, it will come back. Sometimes it happens that uh, the internet becomes slower or something. So um, we are sitting in the background and trying to make everything as smooth as possible, but uh, we can't do anything really about uh, any internet connection issues. Otherwise, if you have any questions, Wendy is our host during this meeting. Thank you very much, Wendy, for helping us out. And Faye is our co-host. Also, thank you very, very much. And um, so if there are any problems, just let us know in the uh, section where you can send messages and they will try to take care. And um, then Mary will go with you through um, how the retreat will be and through the schedule and everything. So I won't uh, say much about this. But uh, you and all of you, I think, ho know her. If you don't know her, she's an uh, ordained nun since 2015. She's a full bhikshuni nun. And she's very experienced in meditation. That's why we're actually really thrilled that she can have this course with you because um, I personally think you will really, really benefit from it. Even if you already meditated before, it doesn't matter at all. It's always nice to get different inputs, to sit again with things or yeah, just uh, validate what we already learned. If you're completely new, also we are very happy that you join because I think this will be a wonderful start for you. Otherwise, uh, at one point, we hope we can welcome you at Land of Joy. Uh, on the other hand, what's great is that we can host quite more people than we could ever at Land of Joy. So uh, in this case, it's quite nice to have Zoom. So thank you very much. And I hand over to Van Mary. Thank you. Oh, wait, uh, Van Mary, you have to unmute. I am muting. How's that? Okay. <laughs> so thank you for joining me on, especially on such a, a wonderful day. The sun is blazing here. It's a wee bit of a shock, this part of the world. It's beautiful. So as you know, these five days, um, it's looking at really the very basics of meditation uh, in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. When I was talking to a few people about doing this course, um, many that, that um, hadn't studied Buddhism very much and a few people who meditated but were not Buddhists. What came across was people not being really that sure why they're doing it, really. Um, the most, um, the answer that comes up the most is relaxation. Relaxation. Uh, and so if I say to people, why do you, well, it's for relaxation. And that's very common. Is that a good thing? Absolutely. I mean, it's wonderful to be able to relax. But cats can relax. Dogs can relax. Human beings can do more than that. But relaxation is vital. It's a vital first step in meditation. So I don't dismiss it. But it is certainly not. In the Buddhist tradition, it's not the goal. It is one step. In fact, a very important step on the path to meditation. Another response I tended to get was, oh, that's good. You'll be teaching people to clear their mind, empty their mind. And I'm thinking, I don't think so. But isn't it strange? Everyone has got their own idea about meditation. Normally, it's informed by the context that they find important. So if you have someone who's doing yoga, the response you get tends to be very much related to yoga, tai chi, if they're in any kind of therapy, the meditation is related to therapy. So there seems to be a lot of whys. So in this course, what I want to do is really make it abundantly clear that in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, there is a clear why 
we meditate. So that's some emphasis here. The structure is over five days, but the good news is you won't have to listen to me for a full five days. Today is um, the normal teaching, which is 10 to 12, and then 2 to 4. Each session is two hours, no break, but if you have to go to the toilet or go and get a drink, you just do so and come back, but there's no set break. So that's today. So today finishes at four. Sunday, um, the morning is what's called personal practice. So by the end of today, I will have given you um, some homework because I know everybody loves homework. But it's a suggestion to continue the retreat in a particular way that will enhance your understanding of meditation through practice. So on Sunday, it's personal practice in the morning, and I will teach from two to four in the afternoon. On Monday, I will teach 10 to two in the morning, and then it will be personal practice in the afternoon. But again, I'll give you homework, I'll, you know, up to you whether you do it or not, but if you want to keep the retreat going, it's very good. I'll, get, I'll be quite clear on what I would like you to do. Up to you then whether you do it. On Tuesday, the morning is personal practice, again with, with clear direction. And on Tuesday, I will be teaching from two to four. Wednesday, I'm teaching all day. That's 10 to two, two to four. I'm hoping, depending how we get through this, that Wednesday will be um, focused really on shamatha. And that's what I'd like to do. But again, it depends on how we get through this. Any questions about the structure? Clear? Okay, okay. So as I said, um, relaxation is vital. It, it absolutely vital. The body and mind, although uh, different, they're so closely connected, you know that if you have a tense body, your mind tends to be quite tense. And if you have a tense mind, that your body aches in different places. We know, we know the connection is very close. And because in meditation you're, you're changing your focus from that which is external to that which is internal, it requires deep relaxation of body. The deeper relaxation, the better. What your aim is, now you may not get this for a while, but always be clear about the aim. The aim with relaxation is to have a body that's almost asleep. It's so relaxed, but a mind that's sharp and clear. That's what you're aiming for. But you don't worry if you don't get it. Believe me, I was years, many years, so, but just go for that, go for that. See that as your end goal and then just practice as relaxed as you can get it, almost asleep, but a mind that's bright. That's what you're aiming for. And so what we're going to do now, we're going to do a relaxation exercise. We're going to set a very strong positive motivation. And then those who are happy to do prayers will do the um, short refuge and bodhicitta prayer at the beginning. And then we'll go into the teaching. For those of you who perhaps are not that keen on the prayers, then if you've set a very strong positive motivation, please feel free to stay with that. Hold that gently with your mind. So please arrange the body in a kind of um, position that you're used to. We'll be going into posture later, but just keeping the back reasonably straight. Have your eyes any way that's comfortable for you, open, closed, half closed. A tall neck and a slightly inclined chin, that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. 
to help you turn the mind inward. Become aware of how your whole body is reacting to each in-breath and out-breath. How your whole body is reacting to each in-breath and out-breath. allowing one part of your mind to gently scan your body from the crown of the head to the tips of the toes, simply noting any area of tension, doing nothing about it, simply noting and moving on with the scan. And without any effort, without any change in your natural breath, simply notice that on the out breath, the tension eases away from the body naturally on the out breath. And as the tension eases from the body naturally on the out breath, notice that even your scalp has become relaxed. And this has caused ripples of relaxation to gently cascade down the body and through the body and wherever these ripples touch, all tension is released, relaxation deepens. And as this continues, notice how smooth your forehead. How spacious the area around the eyes and between the eyes. the unclenching of the jaw.
the drooping of the shoulders to a much more comfortable position. And so it continues all the way down the body. And move your awareness now to your abdomen. Normally held so tight. But now, becoming aware of the movement of the abdomen with the breath. And stay here with the movement of the abdomen with the breath. Fully immersed in your awareness of the rise and fall of the abdomen with the breath. Make a mental note of how relaxed your body actually is. Just note. And remaining at this level of relaxation, become aware now, without any effort, without any change in your breath, simply become aware that while maintaining this level of relaxation, on each in-breath now, your mind is becoming brighter. On each in-breath, your mind becoming sharp and clear. Natural. To enhance the brightness of your mind, shift your awareness to the entrance of both nostrils and the upper lip. Focus your attention on the sensations there of each in-breath and out-breath. Each in-breath and out-breath. making a quick note of how relaxed your body is now and how sharp your mind is. Just make a mental note. This is the mind that you make a strong, positive motivation for today.
So bring to mind a strong, positive motivation. My advice is to keep it kind of short and sharp. And when it's clear in your mind, shift your focus to the motivation. Try to fill your mind with that motivation. Gently. And if you're happy to do so, you can do some prayers. Prayers are very helpful, very helpful for motivation. If they're meaningless ritual, don't do them. It can turn you off. For some people will do it and then sometimes they get used to it, but meaningless ritual can be useless, but they're very helpful with your motivation. So if you're happy to do so, we'll do the motivation prayers. So they should be appearing on your screen. Uh, Mary, do you want the prayers from the beginning? Uh, I just want the refuge one, really. Okay, thanks, dear. That one? That's the one. Thank you very much, Wendy. Brilliant. So we'll do twice in Tibetan, once in English. Sangi Churnam La Jan Chu Garbu Dagi Kapsu Chi Dagi Jin Boke Pe Sonan Ki Rola Pekir Sangi Jupasho Sangi Churnam Spoke Churnam La Jan Chu Garbu Dagi Kapsu Chi Dagi Jin Spoke Pe Sonan Ki Rola Penshir Sangi Drupashu. So when we do the refuge prayer in English, read it like a commentary on Tibetan Buddhist meditation. It's a commentary. Think about it. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Ascending. By my merits of listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha to benefit transmigrating beings. Thank you. So, although some people are not that keen on prayers, if you see them as a study and as a commentary on the practice you're doing, it is very, very useful, extremely useful, particularly the refuge and the bodhicitta prayer. So I would start straight away by saying, when you do meditation, if you're doing any meditation session, there's lots you have to do, of course, but setting the motivation, getting the relaxation and setting the motivation is absolutely crucial. We don't get that right. I don't think anything else really follows. And so to help with the motivation, the prayers are vital. Yeah, they're very helpful. Okay, good. <laughs> Any question about what we've done so far, that relaxation? So many of you have done different types of practices where you've practiced different types of, of relaxation. 
I would say that whatever gets the job done is useful. So if you have another way of relaxing and gets you to a very high state of relaxation where the body is almost asleep, then there's nothing wrong with using that. And there are many different types of relaxation exercises. So I think what we have to think about now is what your definition of meditation is in the Tibetan tradition. If you were to speak to someone and they said to you, what's meditation? Just think about this. What would you tell them? Maybe chop down a few things. What would you say to them? Someone says to you, oh, you're a Buddhist. They do a lot of meditation. I've never been clear. What is actually meditation in Buddhism? What would you say? What type of concept would come up in your mind? And when this person says, yeah, but it's all about relaxation, isn't it? What would you say? And their friend turns around and says, no, it's not about that. It's really about emptying the mind, having a blank mind. What would you say? In Buddha Dharma, it's really important to grasp very early on that the words we use, the language code we use within Buddha Dharma, doesn't always translate to the same meaning in ordinary English. Doesn't do it. And so we need to be clear that for in Tibetan, the word for meditation is called gom. Gom. That's why we have gompa, you know, meditation, yeah. So gom. And what does that mean? It means familiar, making familiar. Making the mind familiar. Making the mind familiar with what? With positive attitudes and positive states of mind. In Tibetan Buddhism, this is very, very clear. There is no real negative connotation to the word meditation. Used correctly as in Buddha Dharma, it's completely positive. It's about making your mind familiar with positive attitudes and positive states of mind. Why? Because the purpose of Tibetan meditation, Buddhist meditation, and I think all Buddhist meditation really, is about gradually transforming the mind. <laughs> you know. They're not hiding this. They want to transform you to transform your mind. How? By reducing, gradually reducing negative, harmful states of mind that brings nothing but pain and misery to yourself and others. And, and gradually transforming the mind by increasing positive attitudes, positive behaviors that are very beneficial to yourself and others. And if you were to think about context and you're thinking, well, what about, what do you mean by positive states of mind? Because you, you may know what positive states of mind is, but it might not be the same for others who are asking you this question. And people do. If you're a Buddhist, they will ask you this. So feel, feel free always to think of examples, always to think of examples. What type of examples would you give this person? that you're talking to, what examples 
What do we mean by positive attitudes? Well, you might come up with things like compassion, loving kindness, generosity, patience, all of that. You're moving your mind towards that. What are you moving your mind away from? Well, clearly, anger, jealousy, attachment, hatred, be clear. Because when you say transforming the mind, sometimes people have connotations of things like mind control and this type of thing, but it's not. It's you becoming familiar with positive, beneficial states of mind. How do you do this? By gradually transforming the mind, reducing these negative, harmful mental attitudes and behavior, and promoting positive. And if you do that enough, even in circumstances where you're taken unaware, your immediate response, if you've transformed your mind reasonably, your immediate response is not negative, your immediate response is positive. Someone comes and shouts at you, very harmful, very hard. Negative state of mind, retaliate, how dare they, or get upset. People who are transforming their mind, their first idea is, maybe, why? What have I done? Have I contributed to this some way? And that becomes normal. That's what I mean by transforming. Not just transforming by knowing you're going into a difficult situation, getting your mind set and, you know, going. And that's good. But you really know if you've made a difference is when you're confronted with something that before would have made you angry or upset or the need to retaliate or that tightness in the body and mind. But if your immediate response occasionally is... I wonder what set this up. How did I contribute to this? This person is very unhappy. This type of thing. You know your mind is beginning to transform. The Dharma is very clear about these things. You can, if you monitor yourself, see very clearly if meditation is having a beneficial effect. The other thing you might say is Tibetan Buddhism really, in meditation, um, is always positive, but it's not an end in itself. And that is really what I've been saying. But that can, become, that can be difficult for some people because people, many people live in a, secu in a secular frame of mind, in a one life, one world situation. And so their meditation, really their purpose is to make this life better, to be calmer, to be kinder within this one world setting. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. Wonderful, very beneficial, but it's not Dharma. In Dharma, meditation is not, is not an end in itself. It's a vital tool, a tool to direct the mind. To achieve the goals that you clearly set out. It's a tool to calm the mind to achieve the goals that you clearly set out for yourself. So be clear here, with, with secular meditation, which is very positive, very helpful, just not dharma, really what's pushing this is uh, this life, this, this interaction with this life on a physical, psychological, sociological, health, well-being. But it's all to do with this life only, usually which is very beneficial and it has the benefit of seeing immediate results. People benefit so much from this. What's the contrast with Dharma? With Buddhism, Buddha Dharma, you're looking at uh, meditation as a tool, allowing you to work with the mind, have some control over the mind. And with strong motivation, it is to benefit ourself and all living beings without exception. Not just in this life, but until liberation or enlightenment is achieved. Of course, there are stop gaps along the way. Of course. And not everyone starts meditation, even Buddha's meditation with his motivation. They just want a, a happier life. 
They don't want to be so angry. They want to be able to relax and study without getting tense. Many Buddhists start off like this, but you don't stay there. You don't stay there. It is a tool to work with the mind with strong motivation. It really is about benefiting ourselves and all living beings without exception until liberation or enlightenment is achieved. There's the difference. Now, many people, and there are many courses on how to meditate. Many, many, many excellent books. But none of that will work unless you're really, well, that's not true. It'll work to a certain level. But unless you get it clear why you're meditating, then the real richness, the real nourishment from meditation doesn't arrive. And so I'm going to ask you to go into groups now. And if you can, just be honest with each other. Here's what I want you to do. Please be clear. Why is it you want to meditate? Why? What do you like about meditation? Because I don't know about you, but for many years it was a complete trial to me to even start to do this. So why do you want to meditate? What do you like about meditation? And what gets in the way of regular practice? That's what I'd like you to talk about. Get this right, and the rest is easy peasy. So maybe 15 minutes? Okay, let's see how, check how it is after um, 15 minutes. Are we all back? Yep. Okay. Thanks so. Okay, so before I ask a little bit of feedback, because as you know, I love feedback, but just reflect again on the why, you know. It's so important to be clear on the why. Your first why may be quite low grade. Don't worry about that. But try to keep upping the why you're doing so until you get kind of a really pure pure motivation. And when that's lodged in your mind, you'll not lose it. One of the reasons that the why is very important is because it gives energy to the how. And unless you're one of these special people that love to meditate from the get-go, unless you're one of these special people that, oh, there's nothing I enjoy better than meditating. Hmm? Be very special people. Unless you're one of these, you need to have the why clear. Get the why clear and you will get the energy. And keep increasing that why, you know, until it's very pure, very pure, simply to benefit yourself and all other living beings without exception until liberation or enlightenment is achieved. And you get it into your mind eventually, not straight away, but eventually nothing else is worth it. You get to the stage where nothing else is worth it. That's what's worth it. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I'm still trying, but here we go. So let's have some feedback. Who would, which, uh, were you in pairs? Yeah, so I don't need to hear from everybody, but um, I would be really grateful to hear from a, a few people to see how you got on with that. And by doing that, you're also helping everybody else in the group. Hi there, Mary. Who am I talking to? Zoe. Okay, not seeing you. Let me see. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it, Zoe. Go for it, Zoe. I'm, I'm not quite seeing you, but... Oh, okay. That's fine. Um, uh, so we were talking a lot about our barriers, the things that kind of get in the way. Um, so, um, but the, the reason that we want to meditate, really, is quite a big reason. The ultimate goal of enlightenment, that's what we said. So uh, there's obviously lots of small reasons why as well um, yeah. on a daily basis, yeah. but I think we've all, we all three of us had the ultimate goal of enlightenment. This is the reason that we want to 
that we want to meditate. Um, I don't know. Lots of lots of reasons why we enjoy meditating and that we can we all kind of admitted that we're not um meditating today like we'd like to um but we already kind of see the benefits so making us more peaceful um which enables us then to be kinder to others um developing our wisdom so that when we're in difficult situations we we can handle them a bit better and we're more patient with other people um and yeah barriers we talked about um getting up in the morning and uh, having pets to feed and, and take out to the toilet, having the kettle there to put the coffee on and just general life kind of to-do list type things really. Um, so yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? I don't know if the other guys Thank want you. to add anything. And did many, I, I presume many people had the same type of um, conversation. Mm. Thank you. Mm. What in life we tend to do what we enjoy. In fact, we're more likely to do that which we enjoy than that which is just kind of so so. So we have to ask ourselves how truthful am I being to say that I actually enjoy meditation? Now, this is not pointing at anybody. Basically, I'm talking to myself because for years I used to say, oh, it's great. And I would do everything in my life to, to absolutely avoid it. <laughs> <laughs> Analytical meditation where I had to sit down and do a little bit of study and think about it, no problem. I enjoy study. So I enjoyed analytical meditation. However, any other type of meditation was, and people who have known me for more than 40 years know it took me many, many years. I didn't enjoy it. I enjoyed the study and sitting quietly, which is a kind of analytical meditation. But as for anything else, no. We do what we enjoy. So whoever's out there, if you're out there thinking, yeah, I do enjoy it, ask yourself how much. Because if you really enjoyed it, you'd be doing it often. Because this is the life we live. <laughs> you enjoy eating, you'll eat at least four times a day. Anything you enjoy. Then you have to say to yourself, I enjoy it, but how important is it? You see, if it takes, and this is life, isn't it? Feeding, feeding the animals, getting the kids ready for work, blah, blah. There's so much, right? The activities of daily living are countless. Why do we do these activities of daily living? Because they're necessary. We see the value. We know what happens when we don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Try not feeding your animals first thing in the morning. Good luck with that. And everything else. So now you have to ask yourself, how important do I see meditation? Because if I thought it was important, I would make time. I would make time. Of course, for many years, I did not make time because I didn't see it was that important. I thought analytical meditation was more important than anything else. So I didn't make the time. This is why you have to be honest with yourself on why. You have to be honest with yourself on what, do you actually enjoy it? If so, how much? Because in this life, you repeat what you enjoy. If you put it on the back shelf, I would question how much you enjoyed it. If I put everything else first, apart from life and death, I would question myself how much I actually enjoy that. Sometimes it's easier to have a long-term goal, such as achieving uh, liberation and enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. We say that a lot, but it's way, way, way in the future. I've got time. I've really got time to do this. And when I'm a bit older or the kids are at school or whatever,
having small goals to achieve is highly important. So this why requires a lot of honesty and for, for yourself, you don't have to share it. But sometimes when you're honest with yourself, you don't like the answers. Well, I didn't anyway. Thank you for that. Anyone else like to feedback that's different from that? Don't make me point the finger. Just because I'm not in the same room as you, don't, the finger will come out. One more group. Hello. Louise. <laughs> <laughs> it fell to you, Louise. Thank you. Um, so we were, we were talking about, um, we, we were both talking about, uh, Diane and myself, how we didn't enjoy it at first. So we were very, uh, no, we didn't enjoy it, particularly because I think we both, um, we were both had the wrong expectations of it or, you know, kind of it, it wasn't that, that Buddhist, um, view of, of what meditation is but then as we um as we under got to understand through the teachings about about what it is and and the purpose of it and how to set out a, a meditation session so the you know trying to kind of concentrate on a topic and then um and then you know kind of stay with stay with your conclusions although still not very easy um you know get, gaining that understanding made it more enjoyable and actually turned it into something that um that that you could do um but then also how when you start the meditating and familiarizing yourself that you then start to see more of the you know kind of the negative sides it's almost as if you're feeling like you're going worse or you know your negatives are increasing or and how much of a shock that you know <laughs> yeah. um when you when you first first start and it's that that then being kinder to yourself and kind and understanding that um you know these habits have been with us for so long mm -hmm. and actually that then made you know the 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 why do we meditate increasing its importance um because you know these habits of of reacting the wrong way or, or heading to the negative first is so ingrained that without the constant familiarization and meditation we're not going to be able to start that reversal process yes no, thank you no, no, that's very, no, that's very clear, Louise. Very clear. There is an organic feedback. It's, it's almost like a loop. We tend to see meditation as this thing sitting out here. But actually, there's this organic feedback. The understanding the topic, familiarizing yourself with the topic, practicing, and then seeing how your behavior changes. Always being on the alert, being aware. This is, all meditation really should heighten your awareness of your behavior. What it tends to do is heighten the awareness of other people's behavior. Go do that. Heighten the awareness of your behavior, for sure. But there's this organic feedback. That's when you know it's working. That's when you know it's working. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? No? Cowards. No, I don't. <laughs> okay. So what I'd like you to do is um, just... Sometimes when you're out, you've not, not, you're not surrounded by a nice meditation space. You don't have enough time to sit down cross-legged and kind of get your mind in the right space. But if you've started the morning off with a good meditation, good relaxation, then when you want to consider something, you could be out shopping, you could be in your work, you want to consider something, what to do is... If you can still the body, that's really good. So we're going to do that now. Just still the body, however it is, just still it down. Try to get a mental feeling 
for the relaxation that you had right at the very beginning of this. Just kind of try and link into it, how relaxed you felt. Then use a method like the two breath method to calm the body and mind quickly. And just to remind you that's breathing in through the nose, allowing the belly to fill, holding it for a few seconds, and then breathing out through pursed lips for a long out breath, as if you were blowing through a straw. And in that long out breath, simply let the whole body relax. And do that twice, and then just breathe normally, keeping everything calm. And consider the following. Meditation can bring a kind of short-term happiness. That's true. Think about that. Now shine some Buddhist wisdom on that. That type of happiness is temporary. It's limited. In the end, unsatisfactory. And above all, illusory. How does that sit with you? Add Buddha Dharma into the mixture. And what you have is deep lasting benefits. Genuine lasting happiness. This is achievable. But we're so hooked into happiness that's short term, limited, unsatisfactory and illusory, we think that's happiness. But add Dharma to the mix in meditation, what you find is that you have access to true happiness, deep lasting benefits, genuine lasting happiness. Is the contrast clear to you? It is highly possible when meditating to simply motivate to de-stress and relax. And that's highly beneficial. But if we take advantage of this precious human life and add Dharma to this mixture, what you have is to increase and develop your potential, to allow your Buddha nature to shine through. When we live our life, whether we're meditating or doing anything to help ourselves with kind of limited idea of life, what we 
we're actually doing is habitually betting on samsaric happiness. It's a roll of the dice. I'm betting that by doing this, my life will be happier. Now add Buddha Dharma to the mix. Your aim now is liberation and enlightenment. There's no betting here. You're not limiting yourself to samsaric happiness and yet samsaric happiness will occur. The moment you put your mind on achieving liberation and enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings without any effort on your part, samsaric happiness comes. It's a byproduct. So making your mind familiar with positive states of mind. To be successful, we need to clearly identify the why. Motivation is crucial. We need to keep reminding ourselves again and again. And this is why at the beginning of every Buddhist practice, you focus the mind on motivation. You're setting your spiritual compass clearly. And prayers can be very useful here, but not if it's meaningless ritual. Please consider and identify the last time you were highly motivated to do something. It doesn't have to be Dharma. Try to bring to mind the last time you were highly motivated to do something. How did this strong determination affect your actions? Is there a possibility that you stuck to the task longer than you would normally have? Did you give it more time? How often did you think about that task? Did you discuss it with others, perhaps others who were doing the same type of thing? Did you read around the subject? Maybe watch some YouTube videos?
and ask yourself this, did you arrange other life events in such a way that gave you time to concentrate on this task? Did you do that? Thank you. Any feedback from that? I just love it. I found it very important. Thank you very much. Say again. Who's I, speaking? Everybody. Oh. Marco. Yeah. So. She's saying, sorry, she's asking who's speaking. I'm saying it's Marco. Oh, thank you, Marco. Could you repeat that? Sorry. Yeah, I just want to say thank you. It's a very important uh, topic for me and. Um, so it's very important. Thank you very much. It's very good. It's good, isn't it? It works. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Marco. Anyone else? Any feedback? Um, yeah. Hi. Hi. Speaking to Maggie. 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 Hi, Maggie. Hi, Maggie. Hi, Maggie. Uh, oh, sorry, I don't know. Oh, sorry, I don't know. Um, um, shall I? Oh, yeah. Um, I really like. Um, I really like. Sorry, I'm getting feedback. Yeah, I I realised that um, when I was thinking of what um, was I motivated towards, and it all seemed to arrive around at something where somebody expected me to do something. Um, and that seemed to be the motivation that they'd have an impression of me and so on. I realised it was, um, that seemed to always, without fail, whether my legs were dropping off or something, I'd always make sure I would do it. And it was used. Maggie, we seem to have lost you. Mm -hmm. So, this whole idea of just do it, right? Just do it, right? It's true. But there are things to help you. For instance, if you can possibly do a retreat with a group of people. The value is huge. If you can go regularly to a centre, I know it's difficult with the pandemic, but even with a pandemic, getting together with groups of people online where you're determined for the next half an hour or 40 minutes or what, however long, you're all going to meditate together on a particular topic. Learning to if you practice doing it in a group, it really helps. It really helps. So doing it in a group is very helpful. Very helpful. And if you, when we can go back to centres again, being in a beautiful setting, which is very conducive to meditation, is very helpful. Sorry. I'm not catching it, I'm sorry. Anyone else? Hi, it's Rowena. Um, Hiya. Hi, just, um, you know, put in perspective, I had a work project that I needed to get finished in the deadline. And, um, and, and you really made me think about how much effort I put into that and how I'm changed my what I did every day to, pri to prioritize it and um, achieve it and get it done and get it finished and um, and uh, I have to say I felt a little bit ashamed how much effort I put in meditation compared to 
like the effort that I put into that particular work project. So yeah, thank you for that. That really triggered something in there. Whatever you come up with in this meditation and you think, oh, you know, I'm just doing it all. I'm, you won't be a fraction of the effort I put into for many years not doing this. Not a fraction. You are all amateurs in avoiding meditation. <laughs> Please don't worry about that. Absolute amateurs. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Mary, it's Dan here. Hi, Dan. Hi, Dan. Um, I, I think that it's, it's linked very much to the... Um, to, to, to the last point really but I think the motivation is so important as to for, for, for making you start something um, but then, then becomes a, 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 like a like a momentum I, I'm, I'm in this now and I can't stop and I'm going to carry on and I wish I could get to the momentum part of, of meditation um, you know, because if you my, my thought was it was an enormous um, garden project and it took me a lot of um, uh, a huge amount of time, days, if not weeks, um, but I had a momentum to it, and I, and I think that's I think that, that there's the motivation to start something, but then it's the the real strength I think is having that momentum and keeping on, and you know I'm doing this now. Yeah, that seems, that seems reasonable. I'd like you to consider the role of attachment in all of this. We're so used to doing everything in the external world. And when we do anything in the external world, whether it's to do with family or work, or even leisure, you get feedback. You get usually get positive feedback from people. Mm. There is a reward for this. And we like rewards. In meditation, we have to value small rewards for ourselves. <laughs> And I'm not sure we value that. We tackle projects externally, large and small, which is good. We all need to do that. And we just love the feedback. Even if the feedback's negative, at least someone's noticed. <laughs> In meditation, you have to value. You become your own scientist, really. And you become your own evaluator. And unless you get into the habit of rejoicing in what you do, however small, then you're always going, well, that's not quite true, but the tendency will be to go externally for approbation. One of the best things you can learn is how to rejoice. Rejoice in your achievements and rejoicing in others. But not the Judo Christian thing is I rejoice in other people but not myself. No. Whatever you do in meditation, however far you got, rejoice in what you achieved. Rejoice in it. Make that your feedback. And the other thing to remember is as the great 8th century monk scholar Shantideva said, there is nothing that does not become easier with practice. Nothing. And so, even at the beginning, you're making all this effort and blah, blah, blah. But if you keep at it, gently, all this changes. It becomes easier, more straightforward. You'll still have difficulties, that's life. But gently getting into it, you're putting less and less effort. More and more rejoicing, less and less effort. Until sitting down to meditate is as natural as brushing your teeth. And very few people leave the home in the morning without brushing their teeth. Why? Because someone will tell you your breath smells. <laughs> when you get into it, become easier and easier. It's just as easy to sit down for 10, 15 minutes. Just make that time. What does help is rejoicing. Not really talked about, I mean, it's talked about in, 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 in uh, the Gurupa uh, uh, Buddhist school a lot, but it's very valuable. And we're not in the habit of patting ourselves on the back, unless you're in therapy. <laughs> 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 so rejoicing in what you've done 
It does a lot of things. It lightens your mood, it gets your endorphins going, and you're more likely to sit down again and do it again. Thoughts are important. They are so, it drives everything. Thoughts drive everything. So what's developed in meditation, really, what it does, and you start to see it, it begins to nourish. It begins to feed how you experience the world. It's not just the time you're in meditation. Most of your time, you're not in meditation. Most of the time, you're out in the world. Meditation has got to positively affect how you behave in the world. Otherwise, no use. No use. But develop meditation and it will nourish how you experience the world. Because the mind alone determines whether you're happy. The mind alone determines whether you suffer with the events of this life. It's not that the events of this life and people have no negative effect on you. That, you know, clearly untrue. But whether you suffer because of it is all to do with your mind. Mind alone determines this. And what is meditation? How to control your mind. Transforming the mind from suffering. And when you suffer, you then have attitudes. You then have patterns of behavior, which are negative to yourself and others. But if you can transform that, then whatever's happening, what happens now, your mind goes towards happy, productive patterns of behavior, happy and productive attitudes. You're in control. The mind determines all of this. Because of that, when you're motivated, you have to be specific. You have to be clear. I think you've got to be quite firm. Often people kind of drift into motivation and it's kind of this hazy sort of, yeah, well, I just want everybody to be happy. Really. You know, may I bring them to enlightenment? I'm not putting it down, but it's kind of vague. I'm saying to you, really, have that as your motivation. But when, when you're, before you meditate, be really clear, be specific, be brief. And then hold it in your mind for a bit. Your aims in meditation, your motivation can be short term. May, I'm going in for a, you know, may today bring happiness to myself and others because I've got a hard day ahead. There's nothing wrong with that. It could have a medium, you can have a motivation which is medium medium term, maybe something to do with relationships with your family, or it could be long term, and by long term we're meaning lifetime after lifetime. The way I tackle it, and I suppose many people do, I'm not sure, I, do, I don't really ask people, but I start off really for benefiting all sentient beings without exception. Lama Zopa Rinpoche does this all the time, without exception, without exception. And then I go slightly lower and then that's my main goal. But then if there's something coming up, perhaps someone's asked me to pray for them or they're not well, I would say in particular, may I, you know, my motivation is to be of benefit to this individual. That's how I do it, but I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's other ways. But don't let this overreaching benefit, may, may they achieve liberation like me, just to be words, to be said, 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 said. It's good to say them, but better to mean them, eh? So having that as an overreaching, always having that as an overreaching goal, this bodhicitta is vital. But there's nothing to stop you putting something in. If there's someone has asked you to pray for them or there's something in particular, put it in. And then hold it with your mind, just for a few seconds then do your prayer. Sometimes people start to do a meditation and they're not clear. They think to themselves, right, I've got, a, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to meditate on impermanence. That's, that's what I'm going to do today. And they sit down, they get the motivation and they sit. And they maybe re remember one or two things. <laughs> <laughs> you know? so when you decide to do a particular type of meditation really you need to inform yourself about that 
topic. You don't have to become an expert in the topic, but you need to have done some reading around the topic. Watched a few videos, maybe. Thought about it. Talked to people about it. And when you've informed yourself, there's nothing wrong with maybe jotting down some bullet points about that topic. And then when you go into meditation, you do what's called a glance meditation. I don't think they teach that so much now, but it's a glance meditation. So you're sitting and you gently, you've done all your motivation things and relax. And you open your eyes a bit and you see the first bullet point. And you go inwards and you analytic will be going into this, but you investigate that bullet point, come to some form of conclusion. Open your eyes again, glance at the second bullet point all the way through. You need to have done some practice. Or you could have a book, a book that's opened, it's very clear. You know, the bullet points are there, it's very clear. Don't get a book where you're halfway through meditation, you open it and you have to... Yeah, don't do that. But have a book that's, you can have a book that's clear with, with points on, on impermanence areas to go, and or whatever you're, you're studying, and just glancing and going back into meditation. It's a very good way to do it. Until you're at the stage where you understand most of the points. It's not that you know everything about impermanence you, 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 or whatever topic it is. You, you'll keep learning more, but you've got the handle on it. And when you get like that, you simply sit down and go into meditation. Leg meditation is useful. And so many people use, um, uh, you, know, you know, people like Tukton children the excellent set of meditations and her landmen meditations are excellent and they use them they put them on and they, they follow and that's very good up to a point in the end you really want to be able to do this without anything coming into your ears without anything coming into your mind you just just the topic so although we promote guided meditations please see it as a as a means to an end what is the end? Being able to do your own meditations without noise coming in at your ears. In the West, we, we rely very heavily on guided meditation. It's okay, but that's not the end game. The end game is for you to be able to do this in quietness and in calmness, taking your time, emphasizing the points that are more important to you, not being led by someone all the time. Any questions about that? What do you think? It's possible I've got it all wrong, you know, so good to think. No? Um, it's just Annabelle here. Hi, Annabelle. I just simply want to say that I'm very happy to be reminded about the rejoicing <laughs> because I really don't do that and um, it just felt so good to be reminded of that thank you no oh, you're welcome you're welcome yeah that was never my problem I rejoice in everything I do <laughs> but I can't say the motivation is perfect you know <laughs> the rejoicing is good it's a habit it's a habit, and it's such a wonderful habit to have. Anyone else? Hello, it's Carol. Hi, Carol. Can I ask a question? Because um, when I when I do um, guide myself in meditations, what I notice is happening is that I I go to my preferences. I go I go to the things that I'm uh, familiar more familiar with and that I enjoy more. Um, so it's yeah there's something about being guided that that is enables me to do things that I don't like doing quite so much so it's yeah it's about how you have to get that balance I suppose well I mean meditation are wonderful if you get the right person and when I say the right person I mean the right person for you that's why you should sample a lot of teachers you know because some people the voice just puts me over and some people are very, very sort of 
and now you want to, <laughs> I'm going to sleep. So some, some, met, some people lead in, it might be better for you than other people. It's got, to, it's got a match. And if it matches and you're getting beneficial from guided meditations, there's nothing wrong with that. It's wonderful. What I'm saying is that if you don't move on from that, then you're being lazy. Once you are able to do this yourself, do it yourself. Now, you don't have to stop everything. Maybe if you're really familiar with one particular, use that topic as self-guiding. And then if it's a topic you're not so sure about, use a guided meditation. I'm not saying you should stop. Or, or, I'm saying it's a process. But in the West, we tend to see guided meditation as the be-all and end-all. And I've had people say to me, I would have loved to do meditation, but I can't do it because I haven't got, um, you know, I need guidance. I, I need somebody to talk me through it. Now, there's times when that's important, but don't, don't tell me that's necessary. Not after a while. And what does it matter if you decide to do a couple of meditations on your own on a particular topic? If you're motivated to do it, you've read around the topic, you've watched a few things, you've maybe jotted down a few main points, and you've done glance meditation on this one. If you haven't covered everything, that doesn't matter. As long as what you've done is valuable. The more reading, the more practice you get, you'll get more bullet points or deeper bullet points. And then if you want to add to the mix a lead meditation, that's fantastic. But do you see what I'm saying here? You need to become your own guide. You walk this path. Nobody else does. Teachers are valuable, of course. Without His Holiness, Lama Yeshi, Lama Zopa, my teachers, no way. I'd have never survived any length of time. Not like that. So teachers are valuable. But teachers don't walk that path for you. You do. They're there to help you become totally independent. Any good teacher of any topic really wants you to be independent of them. Hmm. Anything else? Okay. Along with motivation comes dedication. And if we're not good at motivation, I guarantee we'll not be very good at dedication. So at the end of any Buddhist practice, meditation or any, anything you do with the Dharma, you need to practice dedicating. What does that mean? That, well, a lot of things. So let's say, um, You've motivated to do something in the Dharma, right? Perhaps it's um, to help out at a centre. Perhaps it's to um, volunteer to run a Zoom session. Anything. But it's dharmic orientated. You're strongly motivated to do it. Then you do it. And what the Dharma says is, when you finish doing it, immediately, immediately dedicate that energy. So before you did this, let's say the Zoom session, before you did the Zoom session, you had a mindset, right? You had enough, you have a positive energy going, of course. You then do it with strong motivation. You've created more energy. More energy has been created. This energy doesn't last. It's not anchored in the mind. It would take just any activity of daily living, positive or negative, for that to just disappear. Disappear. So Dharma says, don't let this positive energy be wasted. So the minute you've done any, ended any Buddhist practice that you're well motivated for, spend a moment or two just dedicating that energy. It's the difference between, I would like to be able to do this to benefit. Right? You create the energy. Ooh, I have done this and I will do it. There's a different energy. 
And so you dedicate that energy towards, again, depending on what you're motivated for, because you always remember your motivation. You've created that energy. That was my motivation. I will direct my energy now with my thoughts towards achieving what I set out to achieve. Link it. Link it. Don't let any positive practice go without dedicating. You can use prayer here. Again, some people are very happy with prayers, others not. But if you learn a very short dedication prayer, simply spending a moment thinking and saying those words, either out loud or mentally, will cover all the bases. It'll be exactly what you want. These prayers are internal study. They're there to help you guide your thoughts in the right way. If you do that, then that stays on the mind stream. And positive energy on the mind stream does a lot of things. It increases in value. And when the time comes for that positive energy to actually manifest, then it manifests even greater than what you put in. It grows. So when you do something positive, you want to be able to have the benefit of that. You have the benefit of that and not lose it. So dedicate. Make sure it's on the mind stream. Then it's not wasted. You're dedicated. You go out of your house. You trip down the stairs. You swear like a trooper. You don't lose that energy. It's safe. It's safe. But if you haven't done it, and you've done all that positivity, you go out, something happens, and your mind is totally distracted, you just lose it. You just lose all that energy. It doesn't take much. So clearly direct, in dedication, clearly direct this energy to achieving what you're motivated. So much is easily lost in activities of daily living, and especially when those activities of daily living become negative. Dedication. What it does, it stabilizes the energy and insight that you've achieved. That's basically what it does. It's, it keeps it safe on the mind stream. It stabilizes any positive energy, your insight, and it ensures future beneficial results. And that is skillful. So why wouldn't you do it? Why wouldn't you? It's only habit that we don't do it as often as we should. So at least start from morning to set it up and at least dedicate it might. But you can dedicate as you go through the day. And I'll finish with this. We're talking about meditation, but the bulk of your time is outside of meditation. So Lama Zongkapa, he said, serious meditators, not serious meditators, but people who meditate must, if they want success, they have to what's called three recollections. The first recollection is your meditation object. Now, Lama Zongkapa is talking about a particular type of meditation, but it stands, it's, it stands. The first recollection is keep your meditation object in mind. Now, this is mostly shamatha, but mostly the object would be to benefit others. Or it might be, I've got difficulty with emptiness. I'm going to try and see this. Whatever happens to me today, I'm going to try and see its nature. So whatever you're meditating on, Keep it in mind out of meditation. The second recollection that Lama Zongkapa um, heavily emphasizes, if you're trying to control the mind, you have to have merit. You have to have positive karma. Well, merit's more than positive karma, but you can think about it like that. You need a lot of positive karma and you need to reduce negative karma and so throughout the day the bulk of your time 
Be aware of morality. Be moral in everything you do. That'll calm your mind. That'll calm your mind. So whatever you're doing, the second recollection is increase your merit, reduce your negativities by your behavior. And his third, and I often think the most important recollection Lama Zonkapa emphasizes is morality. Be moral. Think about what morality means to you now in a kind of secular way. But what does morality mean? Dharma. A lot of similar components, but not always the same. Secular morality is Buddhist mor morality light. Light. So these are the three recollections. And they're very, very important. You spend more time out in meditation than in. I'd like to stop there. So, well done sticking out for the morning. Very, very impressed. Anything you'd like to say? Any question? Any clarification? We're coming back at two. And we're going to take this a bit further. There'll be more meditation, but we're going to take meditation further. If does anyone think I'm going too slow, can I say this on my own? When people have difficulty with meditation and they chat about it to me or to anybody, they think their problem is some sort of big, difficult thing, maybe tantric meditation, or this is the, the actual topic is too difficult. And I often, often, it, it's, it's these things that are not quite right. This is where people fall down because they learn this and then they quickly forget it because the topic becomes more important than the process. This is why I'm emphasizing the process. So, any questions? Any ideas? Can I say something? Who's, who, who, who am I speaking Kathleen. to? Now? Kathleen. Hi, Kathleen. Um, I would just like to say I'm rejoicing in being able to use Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, I've tried all day with Faye to get my laptop to work, Zoom, and we just couldn't get it to work. So I wasn't actually going to come on the course because I thought, oh, put, put my hands up and say I am I'm hopeless with anything. Uh, Faye says I've got bad internet karma <laughs> um, but I to get it to work so hey <laughs> because I was very similar at 8 o'clock this morning going this doesn't work <laughs> so welcome I'm glad you persevered yep <laughs> thank so you oh, you're welcome anyone else I've got a question oh uh huh who, who are I Vina Okay, dear. Hello. Um, if you have set um, a strong motivation um, and you didn't dedicate, would the strong motivation not cover you? No. And why not? Good. You wouldn't, I mean, if you motivated and didn't dedicate, is motivation beneficial? Yes. They stand alone mentally but they work together in practice so if you motivated without dedicating that motivation is very beneficial no no doubt there no doubt so if you forget to dedicate then you don't get the benefit of the dedication which means you don't get the benefit of of that energy being kept safe and therefore being beneficial to you later so so can you speak about the mechanics of dedication the mechanic why, why do you need why, why do you need to dedicate the energy could the process of pursuing the meditation in and of itself not be the cause of merit within tibetan buddhism energy flows 
positive and negative energy flows. It comes and it goes. Energy motivated by dharma, by dharma, is seen as very special energy. The benefits of which you don't want to lose. And because of Buddhist understanding of the nature of mind, because of Buddhist understanding of the nature of karma, then dedication takes that energy and pushes it deeper into the mind. It, the mind is not like a garden, but just think of it like this. If you do something good, it's like a seed falling on the ground. It could take root or a strong wind could come and blow it away. So an analogy would be like this. Dedicating is this positive seed is there on the mind stream. It's definitely there. It doesn't go anywhere else. It's not hanging about. It's there. Dedication pushes it into the mind, keeps it safe. And so when that flourishes again, you get the benefit. To understand mm -hmm. that or even get um, a handle on that, the nature of mind becomes important and certainly good teaching on karma. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So, mm -hmm. what we do now is we think, just take your mind back to the motivation that we had this morning. Just gently relax the body. Remember how relaxed your body was and how sharp your mind is. And sometimes a few breaths of on the out breath, just letting everything relax. On the in breath, brightening your mind. Just a couple of breaths like that can really get you in the zone. And remembering the motivation you had right at the very beginning. Between then and now, you've, you've created positive energy just by listening, discussing and thinking about the Dharma. It's there now. You want to make use of this in the future. You don't want to lose it. It wouldn't take much. How do you do this? By mentally dedicating that energy towards achieving your motivation. And prayers help with that. So now we'll do a dedication prayer. So we'll do that in English. And just think to yourself, may whatever virtue I have collected this morning benefit the teachings of all transmigratory beings. And in particular, may it cause the essence of perfect, pure teachings Dharma teachings shine forever. Thank you so much. Please enjoy your lunch. If I've not scared you all off, I hope to see you back at two o'clock.